So before we begin, my name is Tanya Spence and I am the People and the Leads Manager for Lambeth Early Action Partnership, commonly referred to as LEAP. I manage and oversee our central or core community engagement portfolio of work. Over the course of the next hour and a half, my colleagues and I will be sharing how we've developed trust and built good levels of engagement with our local families. Given that this learning incorporates nine years of testing and trialling of what works for us, we're hopeful that this learning could be of real use for many of you. We'll be shining a light on four key and importantly cross-cutting areas of our work, which we believe form firm principles of good engagement for reaching families with young children. We'll be hearing today uh, from our We'll be, we'll be hearing from Davina, who'll be talking on behalf of our community activities facilitator, Georgia May, and she'll be sharing how we engage families through activities and events. I'll be talking about approaches used to build trust and develop connections. Our Lambeth Parent Champion Coordinator, Kim Stanway, will be exploring the importance of working with and being led by families. And finally, Davina Belcher, Co-Create Partnerships Manager, will talk about our collaborative partnership working with local organisations. Okay, so the community engagement work that you'll be hearing about today forms part of the LEAP delivery. LEAP is one of five local partnerships which make up a better start, a national 10 year 2015 to 2025 test and learn programme funded by the National Lottery Community Fund that aims to improve the life chances of babies and very young children and their families. The LEAP programme is concerned with the impact of early service intervention and multi partnership working. As our name suggests, the LEAP programme has focused on families with young children from pregnancy to four who live in distinct areas within the borough of Lambeth. This is a borough selected in 2015 due to local need. The LEAP programme is concerned with the impact of early service intervention and multi-partnership working. As our name suggests, the LEAP programme has focused on families with young children from pregnancy to four who live in distinct areas within the borough of Lambeth this is a borough selected in 2015 due to local need. Within the LEAP area, there are greater inequalities for young children compared with the rest of Lambeth. The LEAP area covers approximately 20% of the borough and runs from Stockwell to Mightsfield through to North Brixton and Tulse Hill. These areas are densely populated and comprise of a diverse, culturally rich community. English is not the first language of almost one in five residents in the LEAP area, and economic disadvantage impacts the lives of many. Informed by a large body of evidence and over the lifetime of LEAP, over 20 targeted services have been delivered as part of the LEAP programme. These services have worked to reduce the likelihood of poor outcomes for children, outcomes which have been shown to negatively impact in later life. LEAP service intervention is largely concerned with the promotion of good social and emotional development, communication and language and diet and nutrition. So whilst community engagement incorporates and embodies these elite values within its practice and delivery, it's fair to say that community engagement is less of a targeted service and more of an area of work which flexes and cuts across the broad LEAP service portfolio. The main aim of community engagement within the context of LEAP is to connect families to different services as well as to each other. My title, People in the Lead Manager, serves as a commitment to ensuring our families are at the part of everything we do. I also want to take this opportunity to note that within community engagement we work really closely with Lambeth Council to oversee the parent volunteering arm of delivery. This has formed an important part of our community engagement offer and we'll hear more about this from our LEAP Lambeth colleague later today. Before we talk about our practice and processes some headline stats to share with you about the impact of our work as follows. So from 2017 to the current day 6,784 individuals have participated or engaged with LEAP community engagement activities. So this figure is inclusive of 3,500 children. 3,000 of those in individuals who we've engaged have been from the targeted LEAP areas. Now, there has been a whopping 36,000 attendances to community engagement sessions and events overall, with 5.41 the average attendance rate for participants attending a session or event in their local area. Whilst we remain in an evaluation phase, our data is positive and it's showing that one in families, 
one in five families, sorry, whose initial contact with LEAP is through community engagement activities, then go on to use other LEAP services. And families whose first contact with LEAP is through community engagement activities will engage with more LEAP services overall in comparison with families that first enter through other routes. You'll be able to read more detailed information about our impact in our learning report, which we'll share with you after this webinar. In this report, you'll find practical examples that you can use in your own work. And later this year, we'll publish the LEAP annual learning report, which will share further research about engagement across the whole LEAP programme. As LEAP is now in its final year of delivery, and this is a super sad face here, we are keen to share our learning and best practice with others, whether strategically planning, directly delivering, or even funding similar pieces of work. Whilst we know we've been fortunate enough to have the resource, the capacity, and the space to test and trial what works, we recognize much of what we've learned can be replicated in some way, shape, or form. And this is something which has really formed the basis of the webinar today. Importantly, we also hope to use this platform to recognise the value and importance of investment in community engagement initiatives, whatever the programme aims. As outlined by Local Government Association through a resident polling survey conducted in 2020, there is a real window of opportunity to further benefit from renewed relationships following the COVID-19 pandemic, which saw community engagement initiatives positively enhance trust with local councils and other institutions. And as reported by the National Housing Federation, with children making up 30% of people in need of social housing, there is evidence to suggest that community engagement may be applied as an effective intervention in supporting the mental wellbeing of families living under housing insecurity. Whenever I'm asked to describe our community engagement work, I often like our delivery to an octopus with lots of arms. Whilst our work is well considered, strategic and informed, it's also fast paced and responsive. Whilst we review our work against carefully considered plans and in line with the theory of change, we know the importance of being able to bend and flex. Whilst our engaged families enjoy the familiarity of offers, we're also always monitoring and exploring the ways in which we can do more to reach those families we haven't seen. Our work is required to be practical and within budget, but also creative and dynamic. One festival saw us bring the seaside to local estates where families live. Uh, a topic of much discussion was how on earth do we transport the water and sand? And yes, it's rewarding to develop the relations with families and watch children grow over the years, but it can also be hard on the team when efforts don't necessarily yield the success we would like. In addition to, and quite literally, navigating the sun and rain, we as a team have weathered several storms. I've briefly mentioned COVID, and I know we can all relate, uh, but the death of George Floyd was also a really difficult and significant moment in time for our families and the communities we serve, with many elite parents and carers sharing their concerns for their children's future. Now, one hour and 20 is not enough time to cover everything we would, we'd like. Uh, believe me, uh, the team, team could talk for England. Therefore, I want to reiterate that following this webinar, you'll be able to access a more detailed outline of our work, review findings, watch videos, and re read further blue sky thinking and recommendations. And as the work of LEAP community engagement starts a planned wind down, um, as LEAP moves across its final year of delivery, we're keen to be working and supporting other like-minded organisations with their community engagement work. So please, please do uh, get in touch with us um, after today's webinar, if you'd like any further or more in-depth conversations. Okay, so that's enough from me. Uh, and without further ado, I shall now pass over to Davina Belcher on behalf of Georgia May, who will be covering best practice um, and learning in relation to delivering activities and events for families. Thanks, Tanya. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Davina Belcher. And as part of the LEAP community engagement team, I work alongside the amazing Georgia May Campbell, who is our community activities facilitator, who unfortunately due to last minute unforeseen circumstances um, is unable to join on this webinar this morning. Georgia May in her role is responsible for organising all of our activities on offer to families that help them to engage with our wider LEAP services and beyond. The aim of our community activities is to foster a sense of community and belonging for the parents in the local area. We want families to spend quality time with their little ones 
which in turn will improve their health and well-being while connecting them to wider services that could benefit them. We also aim to signpost and refer families to wider Lambeth services, acting as a gateway to a breadth of offer. To enable these pathways, we must build relationships and trust with families through our programme of activities. To do this, we develop three festivals each year which are tailored to the needs of the community. This is a busy and wide ranging responsibility which keeps Georgia May and the team very busy. Each festival lasts for a few months and acts as an umbrella for four larger flagship events and a variety of smaller weekly keeping in touch events. These keeping in touch events range from mini mobos, our drumming class run in partnership with another charity called Kinetica Bloco that teach little ones about the history surrounding music and of course the chance to make lots of noise, to Zumba for mums and it's a chance for new mums to exercise with their babies. Our flagship events are large scale hook events which happen on Saturdays to enable, often on Saturdays, we hold them not just in the week time during work hours. And we do this to enable engagement from all the family. These happen in larger community spaces, often outside, such as we use libraries and community centres and housing estates. And we attract in these events between 20 to 60 families. And these act as a gateway into engagement with wider services on offer for families. And that includes our keeping in touch sessions which are smaller, more regular sessions that can see between five to 20 families in attendance. And these are, again, often organised in partnership, particularly with children's centres or community groups. To enable for all of this to run smoothly, it means liaising with facilitators, community partners and children's centres to get them on board and coordinate our offers to match the needs of the community. Through our time from early 2017 to November 2023, the community engagement team have delivered 299 of these one-off events, resulting in 9,171 attendances, just to give you a bit of a clue. These range from disco tots for little ones to warm hub spaces for the entire day during the rising of cost of living that we had. And these also include, as Tanya mentioned, seaside play days on local estates where we brought the beach to those who might not be able to go otherwise. At these events, we partner with up to 10 local partners at any one event to provide activities such as face painting, making body scrubs and flower crowns. Families love the wide ranging crafts and a chance to spend time together while often making friends and getting them out and about. Of course, as well as um, accessing practical support from partners, such as financial and housing advice, energy saving packs and free food pantries. Our planning of the festivals is an iterative process which requires a range of considerations. Each festival is planned in partnership with the community we serve to inform what is popular and effective. Through consistent feedback, through a variety of methods, as well as analysing our data, which we collect on our in-house data platform, we're able to keep things fresh and exciting by using the festival model, which we constantly review and adapt, preventing stagnancy. Keeping in touch sessions are also often amended and flexed to the themes of each festival or the seasons, adding in wider provisions such as in the school holidays. This enables us to maintain interest and engagement with families, as well as holding ourselves accountable to making sure that we keep sessions relevant and varied. These activities are all tailored to children aged three and under, but we allow for whole family engagement, including siblings, during periods such as the summer holidays, where our offer needs to bend and flex to meet, fit the needs of everyone. Our planning is also supported by listening to parent voice. This directly informs our offers. Parent voice is including in our service planning, a lot of the time through our people in the lead sessions, which are discrete sessions that happen roughly once a quarter. These sessions are participation spaces for parents to share their opinions, experiences and ideas. We really value the time that parents give to these sessions and so provide gift vouchers, as well as a free lunch and a creche to enable accessibility for all. 
People in the lead sessions aim to empower, value and support parents to build their confidence in their own ability to share their ex expertise on parenting and local services. This feedback is then used to shape our sessions as well as sharing with our partners to improve breadth of local services. You can read more about creating these effective service user participation spaces in our report, which will follow the webinar. Participation working is also at the core of our activity planning. We strive to work with other local voluntary community service organisations as key partners, not just parents. And we deliver our sessions in partnership wherever possible and continue our relationships with our co-create funded organisations and particularly our first five Lambeth consortium partners beyond their set time of funding with us. Later, I'll actually speak a little bit more about how partnership working is key to successfully meeting the needs of our community. But the, for the moment, it's, I'd really like to share with you how important it is to build positive relationships with parents in the early years. And I'm sure this is not new information but we've learned that as well as creating successful partnerships with other organisations within the community, it's absolutely key, as I've mentioned, to create those trusting relationships with our parents. This is a key part of Georgia May's role as our community activities facilitator. She attends every weekly session to support our providers and ensure that best practice is upheld through regularly monitoring sessions and making sure that they fit within each festival model. For example, a recent dance session has been enhanced by our festival theme, shaping the sessions around popular children's stories to fit in with our recent festival of Once Upon a Story. And the facilitator actually fed back that this structure gave her a bit more focus and then the children more variety in what they're doing. When parents know that all of the sessions are high quality, they are more likely to try a breadth of activities. Ensuring best practice from our facilitators also means that we uphold LEAP values and ensure sessions reflect our data findings, our observations, parent voice and partner feedback. Georgia May attends our sessions and that enables her to manage data collection from the sessions and from the parents that attend, but most importantly, to build a rapport and personal relationship with those parents. This provides them with a friendly face to chat to each week and get to know their little ones along the way. When families attend a session and know that they will see a familiar face, they are much more likely to return and often we recommend it to their friends. One parent said of our event, one of our events is, there was adult conversation for me, engaging toys for him, the fire engine and the lovely food was brilliant and the LEAP staff were really engaging and welcome. welcoming. Thank you for organising. Parents feel as though they belong when there's someone there who knows them by name to greet them. This builds their trust over time. Small things like learning parents and children's names or knowing the milestones that they're encountering in their life and their children's personalities all contribute to the feeling of community within session and build meaningful relationships. Once trust is built, they are more likely then to give feedback, which is honest and helps inform planning. Once we've built this positive relationship, we ask parents and families for their feedback in a variety of ways. We actually heard from parents during a People in the Lead session that we did that um, having a range of feedback options is beneficial, particularly to those who don't always feel confident to share. This helped us to understand the limitations to providing on the spot feedback, such as having English as an additional language or confidence barriers. Therefore, we've created a variety of avenues for parents, such as completing surveys online, in session voting, suggestion boxes, and parent participation spaces. When we're able to gather a wide range of feedback, we are able to develop offers for those who may, may not usually feel seen in our activity planning or feeling uncomfortable in certain circumstances or larger groups. One parent shared, this session has made me feel like I'm part of a community. I feel welcomed every time. I can't wait to see everyone again to better our mental health and well wellness. 
listening to the community and enacting their ideas demonstrates the value which their views and ideas hold as we shape our delivery, which is key to upholding the value of parent voice. Parents are able to co-design a programme of events which fits their needs as they are the experts on the needs of parents in the local area. The programme of community engagement events allows parents to feel that they belong in a community which has their wishes at the centre, with one parent sharing. Thanks to Lambert for giving Leap the opportunity to help families and bring families together on things they never knew about. Coming to see that there is a community and things out there for your kids, regardless of any age that you have. Once our feedback and planning and process has been followed, families need to be able to find out about what we're actually doing. It takes many elements to make our festival successful. And another is our marketing, more specifically our online presence. To reach families, Leap uses a wide range of marketing communications in order to engage with families. This includes website content, social media, some targeted paid for advertising in local media, a regular e-newsletter and promotional leaflets and posters. Our marketing is themed in line with each festival and is time to raise awareness and encourage attendance. These marketing tools signpost people to our What's On page on our website, where families can directly book activities and they can do that really easily through our embedded Eventbrite form. Our social media following actually has grown really recently from 500 to 1,154. And by Jan 2024, our Facebook has up to 900 followers. And while these numbers are modest, the demographic of our followers is majority made up of people who live in Lambeth, which means that we are directly speaking to local families and can inform and update them regularly by sharing pictures from sessions, promoting upcoming events and promoting partner services. We're able to provide real-time insights into sessions through stories and reels, which help to demonstrate to parents what our sessions are actually like. One parent shared, I mean, I have an Instagram account, but I've never used it. But having come to Leap, it made me follow you guys to see other things available in and around the surrounding areas. What to do, like the Healthy Living Platform, which is a local food pantry support service. Having a strong presence both online and in person builds familiarity with the brand, which Leap holds and contributes to people's familiarity and trust. Parents gain an insight into sessions through our social media, and this fosters a further sense of community. Along this journey, we have learned a lot about successful engagement and the needs of our communities, and we're still learning. Um, and while building important relationships with many families, completing hundreds of crafts, always being the first on the dance floor at our discos, and always biting off more than we can chew. The process of developing and delivering community events is often one of trial and error. How we believe that, however, we believe that the following have helped us not just reach, but engage with the local community. Here are some kind of key learnings and some considerations that you might um, have for your future um, work. We found that number one, it's really important to have a consistent staff presence at all engagement events. And that helps us to develop an understanding of the families and partner organisations and helps build that trust. Families are able to put a face to the service and feel that they can try new activities with a known person there to support them. Could you consider whether your organisation has the capacity or how you could make the capacity where possible to have someone around to be that trusted person for your service users? Secondly, it's important around the understanding and integrating of families' ideas and feedback. And that shows families how much we value their input, which in turn makes them more likely to give feedback, which then positively shapes our festival delivery. It might be worth thinking about how could you use the feedback that you're given to show that you are really listening and responding to those that you work with as an organisation. Thirdly, the festival model that we've developed prompts reflection on community needs and prevents stagnancy of delivery. This model is adaptable to the community um, and it adapts throughout the year 
depending on need and is reflective of that feedback and data that I've mentioned previously. You might think about what festivals or significant events are important to the communities that you work with. Could those festivals be included in the delivery of your service? And finally, online presence creates familiarity with families and broadens the reach of our marketing. Platforms such as Instagram and Facebook signpost people back to our booking page. Finally, you might want to consider how service users receive their information from you. Is it being communicated in a dynamic and timely way which engages them? Further to building relationships and trust that I've talked a lot about here, Tanya is now, I'm going to hand back to Tanya, and she's going to talk a little bit about the role of our community connector in signposting supporting families to explore those new services. Oh, thanks, Davina. Okay, so in 2023, public health article looking at community empowerment and engagement cited that trust is essential for healthy reciprocal relationships, creating safe environments, engaging in transparent interactions, successfully negotiating power differentials, supporting equity and putting trauma-informed approaches into practice. Nothing could be truer. Within the LEAP programme, which is a broad multi-partnership programme grounded in public health, the need to establish good, trusting relations with local families has been paramount. One of the key aims for our community engagement work has been to introduce and connect families with young children into the various LEAP services. Now, when reaching parents in the community, there will never be a substitute for good old word of mouth. Indeed, this is not particular for those families that we're looking to engage, but it's true of all of us. I mean, I ask you to all think back to when a colleague, a friend or a family member suggested a product or shared a good experience of a service. Nothing could be more powerful than a shared good experience within your own trusted network. Later, we'll hear about the power of developing such networks for our community volunteering work. But until then, we'd like to share our experience of developing connections and gaining trust for our community connector model of delivery. Before we talk about this model, I think it's worth looking at the very real challenges we've encountered when building trust and developing connections with families in this space. So some of the challenges have included the capacity to develop relations. So when we first developed our community engagement program, an early model of delivery saw LEAP invest in family engagement workers. These were staff attached to local voluntary community organisations who coordinated and facilitated spaces and activities for parents with young children. Many family engagement workers were part-time and they were required to coordinate, develop, run and evaluate these engagement activities. There was arguably a reduced amount of time for these workers to really develop rich relations with families within the community. Another area is changing information. So over the course of the programme, there's an identified need, there has been an identified need for something to sit between and strengthen community engagement delivery and the wider LEAP services. This was particularly true as both services and community engagement initiatives would refresh offers and there were changes to timetables and the like. So, for example, you've just heard Davina talking about the community engagement team and the fact that we run free festivals over the course of the year to further promote and refresh the offer. A third challenge concerns breadth of offer. So over the past nine years, LEAP have had a large portfolio of services and support for local families consisting of over 20 targeted services. So this visual that you're looking at is not the matrix. Whilst this is impressive, uh, having this many services um, has presented Lambda families with a lot of information and support to navigate through and make sense of. So this slide hopefully provides a bit of a visual example of the broad LEAP offer. But within this visual, targeted LEAP services are coloured minty green and they're placed within the centre with connections to corresponding external delivery partners positioned within the outer perimeter. Community engagement is the orange section. And then there's trust, confidence and understanding in a service. So we know that those parents who we're trying to reach may face several barriers to accessing some LEAP services. In particular, we draw reference to our social and emotional development services, whereby it is recognised that the parent-child relationship affects children's social and emotional development and their learning, and that parent interactions can really help to build these strong relations. 
when thinking about these services, there may be stigma, for example, concerns about being labelled a poor parent if difficulties are admitted and misconceptions or lack of information. For example, what, around what constitutes domestic abuse or baby's attachment needs and how these can be supported. And then there's the broader holistic support. Whilst LEAP provides far reaching early years support and advice for parents and carers with young children, there is a limit to the support we can offer. We understand the limits and parameters of our work. We recognise our opportunity to signpost families to other partners and organisations who can also help. Again, what is required here is the time and the capacity to understand the ways in which others can best support our parents, as well as those routes to effectively signpost and refer. In light of all of the aforementioned, and in 2021, Year 7 of the LEAP programme, we introduced a new role to trial a different approach to not only making strong connections with families in the community, but to also strengthen the connections had with a vast range of LEAP service leads. The Community Connector role was born and our connector, called Makita, worked to support the development of strong parent care relations. So following what Davina had referenced earlier as important when talking about community offers and activities, this role also ensured a visible presence with opportunities taken to participate in activities and sessions. The role also worked to identify appropriate referral and signposting opportunities. Here, the connector actively listened and confidently communicated with families, explaining what LEAP and other local organisations could offer as support. LEAP's new community connector was also able to help reduce barriers to services by providing parents and carers with the necessary and in the moment information, clarification, assurance and encouragement. The role also supported families to navigate the broad LEAP and wider local offer, working with a range of LEAP services to identify ideal opportunities for families to participate in LEAP services and activity sessions. The Connector's role then developed further to have both an online as well as a physical presence in the community. The Connector, or Makita as she was known, would sign off on all of our parent newsletter emails. Families were familiar with her, they knew they could approach her for information and support. While this connecting approach worked well from the outset, it soon became clear that using lots of leaflets, aid service and activity communications was overwhelming for both parents and Makita. We observed the way in which families were finding and recording information was also changing, with many parents and carers choosing to use their smartphones to interact and record information. Six months into the role, we developed what we refer to as a digital connector tool to support with these interactions. The Connector Tool, a survey app on a digital tablet, included logic flow questions to help those asking questions arrive at the right support or identify the best opportunities for them and their child. Key questions which we used to help filter the right support included knowing an individual's postcode, as some LEAP services were only accessible to families living within certain postcode areas, as well as knowing the age or development stage of the child or the children. It's important to say here that we were really passionate that this connecting approach, aided by an electronic resource, didn't hinder connections and send parents panics and running for the hills. We aimed for this resource to be used interactively with the parent and carer and not simply to them. This digital tool was made to be bright and colourful. It included pictures of sessions and activities and also short videos about services which helped to further inform and allay fear including a visual element, also worked to support communications with parents and carers where English was a second language. By gaining consent and recording contact information via the tool, the connector was also able to provide the individual with further information and give follow-up support. This resource also meant that the connector was able to evidence the outputs of their work. So what did we achieve as a result of the connector role? Well, over the six month period, levels of engagement with connector posts were formally monitored. So only over that six month period, 100% or 132 of the individuals that the connector used the digital tool with and in that period wanted to understand and talk more about the broader offers and support available at LEAP and in their local area. 
as there were multiple outcomes to the connector interaction, for example, a person may require physical information about a service, but may also want to further connect via a one-to-one -one follow up later, I refer to instances of measured outcomes. Outcomes included 89 follow ups beyond the initial interaction, 63 leap newsletter sign ups, 32 instances of physical information shared, 20 formal referrals to a leap service. There were only 10 connection instances where parents and carers felt that no next step was needed. That's amazing because without that connector and her interactions, we probably wouldn't have had some of those outcomes achieved. It is important to note, however, that limits to this work include the fact that the connector could not always use a tool within all targeted services or group settings. It was important to exercise a level of sensitivity and an appropriateness of the service support and environment. Furthermore, despite the obvious benefits aligned to creating a role that is to be so clearly familiar and personable to families in the community, it can be a risk if this person in this role leaves. So what's our key learning? Having a designated connector has been an absolute asset to our community engagement work. Given our learning in this space, we recommend the following. The adequate space and time is given to support the development of connections. So I ask you, is there the capacity in your front facing roles for this? It's important to understand the referral or signposting journeys for those you're working to support. Remember that aspect of word of mouth and how important it is. So do you know what the experience is of those being signposted and referred on? Do you actually know what happens next? We've evidenced that you can develop targeted connection opportunities uh, and that inter interactions can be logged. So are you thinking about a connection in a strategic and measured way? Uh, and as we know that digital resources can be useful and empowering, are you embracing digital as part of any of your connections work? So we're not on any illusion. We know that not every organization can have a full-time connector or prescribe a post, but are your connect community posts or programs investing in this key aspect of engagement work? And to what degree are you providing the resources to equip? Building trust and developing connections with parents and carers naturally leads to our work with parent volunteers. So I'll now hand over to Kim Stanway, Parent Champion Coordinator, to talk more about this area of delivery. Thank you, Tanya. And hi, good morning, everyone. Yes, I'm Kim Stanway, Parent Champion Coordinator here at LEAP. And it's, it's a real pleasure to be able to come and share some of our learning from working with and listening to communities through, develop, through de delivering the LEAP Parent Champion Programme. So I'm gonna spend the next 20 minutes or so giving an overview of the Parent Champion Programme and talking you through some of our key learning points, which I hope will be useful for you to take forwards to develop your own volunteer programmes in your area as a tool for reaching and engaging families. So as we've heard, LEAP offers over 20 targeted services and what better way is there to help parents to make the most of them than through a personal recommendation or through encouragement from another local parent, someone who's been there and often who has done it. And that's where our team of LEAP Parent Champion volunteers have really come into their own. So Parent Champions are simply local parent volunteers who have children under five who are trained by LEAP to use their local knowledge and connections to support other parents and carers. This could be introducing them to LEAP, to children's centres and to broader early years offers and services. Many of them use LEAP services and attend events with their children. And so are some of the best people we have to spread the word about what's on offer and the benefits of getting involved. Now the programme is based on the idea that parents are often the best people to help other parents and that parents are experts, which is a core value of the LEAP community engagement team. The peer-to-peer -peer aspect to the programme is really important as information is shared through natural conversations between parents. And as we've heard, we know that this trusted word of mouth model is really effective. A conversation with another parent about a local service is usually a very different conversation to that with a professional about the same service. 
And our volunteers particularly help other parents who might miss out on vital information about how to access local family services. And for us, these could be parents that speak other languages or are new to the borough, or who just haven't heard about LEAP yet through other channels. So our parent champions, they're like an extended outreach branch of the community engagement team. And they've enabled us to have more positive and informed mouthpieces out in our community, which has enhanced the capacity and the reach of our outreach community engagement work. They often volunteer in their own time, having conversations with other parents in their daily lives, for example, at children's centre sessions, as well as in playgrounds and at school gates. And there's also regular opportunities to volunteer at some of the many LEAP community engagement events that we've already been hearing about. The role is deliberately flexible and we keep volunteering to school hours and to term time wherever possible. It's really important for us that volunteering with LEAP fits around parents' busy lives, um, including their work and their wider family commitments. And over the course of the programme, Parent Champions have provided over 36,000 signposting activities. These have ranged from anything from sharing flyers for LEAP events, handing out children's centre timetables, sharing details of upcoming activities over social media, and telling parents where they can go to apply for their free early learning entitlements. And as has been said, Lambeth is a very diverse borough. English is not the first language for almost one in five residents in the LEAP area. The most common languages other than English include Portuguese, Spanish, Polish, French and Italian. And we have parent champions that speak each of these languages, among others, ensuring that the programme is effective at reaching families from across the community. We're, we're really proud of all that the LEAP Parent Champion programme has achieved. And we've reflected on some of our valuable learning along the way too. So I now wanted to share just three of our key takeaways from our work with you. Firstly, it has been the importance of good quality training when working with volunteers. Now, we know that when volunteers are supported, motivated, well-informed and confident, their conversations with other parents are really powerful and positive and effective, and that they all add up to help bring about positive change for families as we've seen here in Lambeth. Quality training not only provides volunteers with the knowledge that they need to succeed in their role, but also the confidence and the skills to do so. The Parent Champion training that all new LEAP Parent Champions complete has been a crucial part of our programme's success, helping us to recruit, retain and empower volunteers to contribute to achieving our goal of supporting connections between families and LEAP services. And from 2016 to 2023, we ran 132 training sessions and courses with over 800 attendances from volunteers across these sessions. It's an area that we have invested time and resources. So I just wanted to quickly share some of the tips and tools from our learning to help you measure and improve the quality of your volunteer training or provide some ideas for you on how to set it up. So what does good quality training look like? Volunteer training, I should say, look like. For us, it's looked like providing a diverse learning experience through a balance of theoretical and interactive elements, which have included role plays, videos, testimonials, case studies, games and quizzes. We ensure that our content is relevant and relatable to learners and create opportunities for volunteers to share their lived experiences of being parents themselves in the training. I think if we were to continue with our training, we would also consider integrating even more interactive elements like menti polls, for example, in the sessions, just to further increase the interactivity and the diversity of the sessions. Secondly, we provide thorough and varied content. Now, the, our training is delivered over five two-hour sessions and enables volunteers to develop their knowledge of LEAP, the importance of early years, the three strands of early years development, Lambeth Early Year Services, signposting, safeguarding, boundaries, and communication skills. And we adapt to different learning styles. For us, this has involved being in tune with the needs and capabilities of each learner. It can be as simple as recognizing a parent who's more reserved or shies away from contributing, or guiding the more busy thoughts of those more at ease of sharing. Having a good mix of pair group, group activities and exercises 
just facilitates more organic conversation, helps to give everybody in the room a chance to actively participate while feeling at ease. We also work to keep things accessible, flexible and transparent. We provide a free crash at each of our training sessions and keep training within school hours and term time. We also provide a printed handbook containing all relevant policies and we share all the slides electronically following each session. And we recognise and we celebrate achievements, really important. We issue personalised certificates to each volunteer upon completion of the course and we take a celebratory group photo of everyone together at the end too. We engage and we motivate our volunteers. It's not just about learning, we know. It's about enjoying and applying that learning. And at the end of each session, we encourage volunteers to put that learning into practice over the coming week and to come back and feedback to the group on their progress and achievements. Lastly, we have invested in evaluating and improving our training. And we collect data from each volunteer through a pre and a post training evaluation form. This isn't without its challenges, as it's difficult to gain an objective benchmark of a volunteer's knowledge and confidence pre-training. However, it has given us an indication of people's level of understanding at the start of the training. Well, one of our long-term outcomes for the programme, which we identified in the theory of change, is that volunteers have the assets and the skills to reach and support their peers to engage in early years services. And we're really pleased that 89% of volunteers agreed that being a parent champion has given them the skills that they can use in a job or a further placement. And that 92% agreed that being a parent champion has increased their confidence. The parent champion training has really laid the foundations for this level of volunteer knowledge and confidence. <clears throat> so going forwards, here's a few possible questions for you to be asking yourselves um, if it's useful. How do you know if your volunteer training is effective and engaging? How can you possibly improve your training to meet the changing needs and expectations of your volunteers? And how is your training aligned to different learning styles? Moving on, we've also learned that getting it right with volunteers has enabled us to get it right for the community. And by this, I mean that the work that we do ultimately aims to connect families to LEAP and to other early years services. However, this isn't the full picture for us. And this next section is all about how we've worked to put a spotlight on supporting our volunteers as much as ensuring that the program ultimately benefits families in the community. We've heard that building trust is a core value of our team. The very foundations of what we aim to do is anchored in trust and bridging that gap between services and families. And our program just wouldn't work without it. However, this section goes beyond building trusted relationships with volunteers. We very much see volunteers as the end beneficiary alongside the families that they're helping to support. And we invest much of our time in supporting and developing volunteers individually and collectively. We do this through regular, consistent individual support. We offer one-to-ones with volunteers to support their growth, both within their role, but also through their personal development. These informal catch-ups provide just a safe space for natural conversations and a chance for us to understand the needs and the passions of individual volunteers and how we can help best support them in terms of skills building and goal setting. This area of work is often time consuming and we have invested significant amount of time in supporting volunteers with their individual needs. And I'm gonna talk more about that briefly in a minute. Secondly, we work to build a shared sense of community. There's a saying that trust is what shifts a group of people into a team. And we work hard to develop the group's trust and relationships through regular opportunities for volunteers to get together and connect with each other. We do this through monthly group catch-ups, a volunteer WhatsApp group, summer and festive socials, and we hold an annual volunteers awards event too. And over time, we have seen volunteers becoming a natural network and a close knit group. Thirdly, we go above and beyond where we can. Over 50% of our parent champions are parents from the LEAP area and all our volunteers live locally. 
So we know that volunteers face many of the same challenges as all, as other parents locally, including language barriers, socioeconomic issues such as overcrowded housing or unsuitable temporary accommodation, unemployment or having no recourse to public funds. Through the strong relationships that we've built up with volunteers, volunteers have trusted us into our lives and we've been able to support them through many include um, a referrer to a local baby bank so a volunteer could access pre-loved clothes and equipment for her family, securing laptops for volunteers to use at home and for their children to be able to complete homework on, and supporting a volunteer to enrol on a literacy course with a local adult education college. We believe that offering this level of support within our capacity ultimately supports volunteers to be able to focus on themselves their development and their goals, which of course includes their volunteering. So again, if it's useful, here's a couple of questions for you to take away from this section. How do you build trusted relationships with your volunteers? And how are you considering and meeting your volunteers' needs as much as the needs of the community that you serve? Finally, I just wanted to spend just a couple of minutes talking about the importance of ensuring that volunteers are key stakeholders. Now, we know that volunteer input is key in programme delivery success and being able to work collaboratively on initiatives is essential for engaging with families. This has certainly been true for the parent champion work and we've actively encouraged volunteers to come forwards and provide insight and ideas and feedback into ways that we can develop our program to best reach and engage other parents. Two key areas of work resulting from this have been the LEAP Parent Champion Befriending Program and our Digital Champion or our DigiChamps Program. These additional offers have been developed by the Parent Champion team in co-production with Parent Champion volunteers to provide further targeted support to parents where it's needed locally. So trialed in April 2022, our DigiChamps project was a parent focused and it was community led, it was designed and it was developed in collaboration with volunteers. A pool of volunteers from our Parent Champion programme were provided with additional training to help ensure that local families could access free friendly, safe and reliable information about online early year services through offering peer-to-peer -to -peer support, which we offered in children's centre sessions. Now, over the timeline of the project, the needs of local parents were further compounded by the increases to the cost of living and our DigiChamps adapted the project to suit these changing times. We found that requests from parents in sessions, including finding support in relation to broadband social tariffs, home energy assessments, discounted utility bills, NHS, Healthy Smart, Healthy Start cards, and library memberships. And again, this peer-to-peer -peer aspect to the project was really powerful as it enabled parents to be able to come forwards and access timely and relevant support through just having a friendly conversation with another parent in a session, someone who might have had similar lived experiences as them, but also had expertise to share, someone who could relate while providing some reliable support. Secondly, the LEAP Befriending Service was a small-scale, parent-led and complementary programme of delivery, which provided bespoke one-to-one -one peer to support to 23 parents over a 16-month period. Now, these parents were identified as less engaged or isolated during the early stages of their parenting journey. And with the help of befriending volunteers, parents started building up networks of support through more frequent interactions with other local parents. This approach allowed for trusted relationships to be nurtured over time between the volunteer and the parent being supported. And as a result, we saw parents being less apprehensive about attending sessions and we were eventually able to attend early activities more consistently and independently. A real bonus of our befriending service has been the diverse representation of the volunteer base with many volunteers being able to speak other languages, including Spanish, Portuguese, and French. This has resulted in further enhancement of the peer support offered to those families with English as an additional language, who may not have otherwise, or we know may otherwise have found it challenging 
to take up vital leap services such as our breastfeeding support or speech and language therapy, just to name a few. You can read more about the Befriender and our DigiChamps programme in the Community Engagement Report online. I just wanted to introduce them here as they've both been excellent examples of parent-led volunteer initiatives, which while requiring ongoing staff support and resources, just show that when volunteers are central key stakeholders in the design and delivery of a project and given ownership, the results are powerful and meaningful both for the community and for the volunteers involved. So as before, here's a few questions for you to take away from this section if it's useful to you. How can your volunteers be empowered to be key stakeholders? How involved are your volunteers in designing and delivering new initiatives? And how can you best tap into your volunteers' unique skills, experiences and perspectives to further develop your services and activities. Now I'll be leaving things here. So I hope that I've given a useful and insightful overview of just some of the work that we've done to develop our Parent Champion Programme and some of the practice, the approaches and the activities that we've taken to develop our programme and achieve our aims. Before I hand back over to Davina to tell you more about LEAP's partnership work, I want to end with a video of a few Leap Parent Champions telling their own story about their experiences and what they've gained from volunteering as Leap Parent Champions. Thank you. My volunteer role is a parent champion. Parent champion. Parent champion. I'm a parent rep at Leap. My role is digital champion. I'm a parent representative, I'm a parent befriender, and also a parent champion. I've gained a lot of things. I've gained to be confident, to know more people. I've gained friendship, connections. Being able to socialise more and get my little one out as well in the activities. Knowledge as well, coaching, workshops. I've got employment from the Healthy Living Platform which has basically enabled me to go out and cook in the community, some in a voluntary capacity and some as a paid member, which is a food ambassador. I help a parent getting a child to a nursery. She was very worried because she doesn't have anyone to help her with the forms. So I, I went to her, I helped her in filling out the forms. And the next day, her child or her daughter got a place in the nursery, so she was very happy for that. Oh, I was talking with a, a mother with five children, and I was asking her about how this cost of living affecting their family, and she said, like, um, like groceries, and I said, like, oh, you know that live are uh, doing pantries, and she didn't know that, and she lived around the area. My close friend, I've helped freely um, because she's more reserved and she doesn't really go out much and she was starting to get a bit depressed so I kind of just brought her to more of the events from LEAP in breastfeeding and the messy play. There's so much activities that I kind of let her know to just be out more and yeah it, it helps her a lot. I met a mom once in the park and she had the baby during the COVID, so she never went out, she didn't go to the children's centre and she didn't meet any, any other parents. So I told her about LEAP and she got so involved that she started doing classing, classes, courses, meet other people and now she's one of the faces that you see on the leaflet, on the LEAP leaflet. I was able to signpost a parent who was having um, some issues with child development. What I was able to do was signpost her on to the appropriate individuals, staff members, um, who were able to support her. And she still thanks me up until today for the support I was able to give her. My favourite thing about being a volunteer is to meet people, to meet new people, and also helping them to get access to what they need. I'm always with my kids and we go to the activity together like two in one, like they're having fun and we're doing some volunteering too. The workshop and coaching session that they gave, like they, they help you grow as a person, like with your personal goal as well as in, uh, with the organisation. 
I can do things in my own time with my daughter, meeting like-minded individuals, parents like myself as well. Just being able to be a mum at LEAP and helping others, um, as well as the childcare provided, is, is amazing. Oh, that video, love it. Seen it so many times, it never gets, um, never gets worse. Always good to hear those amazing stories. Um, hi, everyone. Um, just a reminder, um, I'm Davina Belcher, and my actual role within the community engagement team is to lead on the partnership working with local voluntary community sector organisations. As you'll have gathered from my colleagues, um, LEAP has partnership at the very heart of its working model. In fact, it's right there in our name. This emphasis on partnership working is based on the premise that no one organisation or service can meet the many diverse needs of local families. Collaborative working is key across the entire LEAP programme, but it's particularly important in our community engagement work as it's enabled us to provide high quality and most importantly, community led and community informed sessions and the events which have supported families in the ways that they have really needed. Since 2017, the community engagement team have partnered with over 180 different community partners, and that includes parents, early years practitioners, nurseries, children's centres, Lambeth Council, NHS Trust, as well as the community organisations locally and charities that are around us. And this has enabled us, as you've heard, to reach over 3,000 families, and that includes 3,500 children. We recognise that local families within our community, they're not a homogenous group. Therefore, working with a diverse range of partners has ensured inclusivity and diversity of reach. And by working in this way with a network of local community-based organisations, We've ensured that some of the most isolated families have been connected to those really important early years services and support available. We've worked in partnership in a variety of ways over the programme. And to touch on just a few, we deliver through partnership. We can't do it all ourselves. We don't know it. We're not experts in everything. But and we really rely on local partners who deliver work poorly using their particular expertise. You've heard about family engagement workers rooted in community, Lambeth Council colleagues, and we work closely often with public health teams. But as I mentioned, there's over 180. And you can see actually in the photo, we work with a dentist as one of our sessions to share their expertise and encourage families. We also deliver in partnership. None of what we do as a community engagement team would be at all possible without partners. And that's embedded into deliver in what we do and through the festivals that I mentioned earlier that Georgia May organises and the Keep in Touch sessions and all of the events that have allowed that 36,000 attendances over the last few years. We also match make new partnerships and they, we will do that with anyone anywhere at all times wherever you are we really believe in the power of that collaborative working and so if we can support or connect or encourage um, different organizations and different services to start working together we will nobody is safe um, part of doing this formally is that we fund partnership opportunities through our co-create funding program. And over the last two rounds, over the last couple of years, we've actually invested in 14 voluntary community sector organizations to work in partnership with us to deliver through their expertise and work with families with very young children. And a lot of those organizations had never done that work before. And so that is new for them working in partnership with us. And out of that work, that co-create work, we are now leading on consortium partnership development as part of our pieces of work. We're working with 10 of the organisations that were part of our previous funding programmes to work more formally together as that collaborative and collective working was so meaningful and powerful for them. They now decided to take that forward under a memorandum of understanding and a more formal partnership agreement. 
and that's first five Lambeth was born and you can see the variety of organisations involved from the logos on the screen and that's really exciting work and I'll talk a little bit more about it later. There's not one right way to do partnerships. They come in all shapes and sizes. And bearing this in mind, being able to flex and adapt in your partnership relationship is key to success. Through our different partnership work, we've found that there's definitely a continuum that varies from one-off um, partnerships, maybe through an event or a particular activity, to casual partnerships, perhaps through re mutual referral and signposting pathways to those more committed working under maybe a partnership agreement. And then there's everything in between. Some partnerships that we've had have moved up and down the continuum at different times for different needs and different situations. Partnership working has so many benefits. And as you can probably tell, I'm pretty passionate about it, but it's not without challenges. And one challenge that we've encountered more than once and one that I'm sure we're all familiar with, whether that's professionally or even, dare I say, personally, and that's being able to recognise when a partnership is no longer working and being comfortable with facing this. Whether this is because a piece of mutual work is ending, if something is not quite working or an unexpected circumstance means that the partnership is no longer viable, we found that it's important to factor that in, to do some collective thinking about how you might navigate it and most importantly, acknowledging that this might happen and being okay with it. And that is important so that you are able to then end partnerships well. I've mentioned many of our partnerships in the abstract. And so I thought it'd be really valuable to share with you one of our most successful partnerships, although we've had many. And that was, um, this partnership was established from the very beginning as part of the LEAP bid phase, which is over a decade ago. And it's been one of the most fruitful from a community engagement perspective. And in fact, one that we have very recently ended very well. And that is with Stockwell Partnership. The decision to partner with Stockwell Partnership was strategic and had mutual value in many ways. But more particularly, Stockwell Partnership were fully rooted and had already spent time and um, investment building trusted relationships in one of the communities that LEAP wanted to reach out to. And for them, LEAP brought infrastructure, resources and financial investment. In a moment, I'll let Marta, Khadija and Sauri tell you a bit more about the work in the video I'm about to share. But while you're watching, I'll give you a little challenge. Listen out for how many other partners are mentioned too. When it comes to LEAP local partnership working, there are always many cooks and this time they don't spoil the broth, they just make it even richer. Hello, my name is Marta Sertel and I'm a family engagement worker from Stockwell Partnership. Stockwell Partnership is a community organisation that delivers a very wide range of partnership projects, community events and services to improve the quality of life for our local residents. We work with a very highly diverse community in Stockwell, including parents-to-be and families with young children. partnership worked together very closely with LEAP on co-designing activities for local families to make sure that they are taking the active part in tailoring the programme uh, as well introducing local network to collaborate on project delivery. So we had to work with the community, for the community, to make sure that programme resonates with, uh, with them. And we decided to invite parents to set up their own initiatives. We liaised with local groups, invited them to design activities, one-off events at the local venues to make sure that we can capture local heritage and different cultures. We developed a very strong network with statutory services, 
a voluntary sector organizations, community groups to find the gaps in provision and that strong collaboration definitely brought more resources to LEAP program and enhance our offer. My name is Khadije, one of the leaders for the community living room space and our group is called the Me Time Group. So my name is Saori Funawatari and my involvement with the Stockwell is to be a facilitator for the baby and mom group. As a new mom, I didn't have no knowledge about having a baby, looking after children. So the person that came in contact with me from the leap and uh, she said to me, oh, we give support on breastfeeding and you get to meet other moms in our activities that you can basically just connect and get more idea about what's happening in the community. I needed some support as a parent because I didn't know what to do. <laughs> so I came across and I think it was a health visitor gave me the timetable from the LEAP and I went to um, the, uh, the St. Stephen's Children's Center where they did yoga for baby and that's how I met Malta on the first day and she was talking about this um, new concept of mom leading some group session. We always wanted to make sure that families take active role in co-designing and co-delivering our program that they feel included in decisions about our activities and services and this approach definitely helped us to reach more families for a longer time and made our program more successful. Fab. Those of you that were eagle-eared, you will have heard that at least other eight partnerships, another eight partnerships were referenced in that video including just a few, the Breastfeeding Network, Art for Space, the Health Visitors and the St. Stephen's Children's Centre. And this video just gives you a glimpse into the one of the more established partnerships that we've cultivated over the years, but there are many, many more I could talk about. Um, from our varied experiences in working this way, I just wanted to pull out some key lessons that we've learned and that might hopefully prompt you to think about how you might apply them in your work. Um, it's worth mentioning here that, as we've said, after the webinar, we'll share a report with you. And then in there, there's a link to a resource that I've developed drawing on the analogy that building an effective and sustainable partnership is a bit like building a house. From building those solid foundations, using the right resources and constant maintenance and working with the right people. You see on the screen, that's what it would look like when you click in. And this resource will provide real life examples, actionable steps and reflective questions to support you to develop effective partnership working. May that be building on those that you've already got or as you initiate new ones in the future. So I hope that you would find that useful and you can access that afterwards. When thinking about partnership working and what would work best, there are a few lessons that we've learned along the way. And one of them is really being led by your limitations. It's important to think about what you're doing well and how a partner organization might complement that. But I would suggest that more importantly, you want to think about what you're not doing. And it might be useful to reflect on what are the limitations of your organization? What are the unmet needs for your service users? How could you benefit from the unique cultural community or knowledge-based resources that other organizations locally offer? Because this is where the real potential lies and where good partnership working begins. This approach will lead to collaborative partnerships that bring mutual value, complement your work and develop an enhanced offer for your service users. As a community engagement team, we're continually reflecting on what we can improve, what our limitations are, what we're missing. And, and we've been able to change and stretch and grow our partnership model to in line with that. And over time, we've recognised varied limitations and that's led us to developing a range of different partnerships. And for example, we strategically built partnerships to reach communities that up until then we'd struggled to reach. 
And in five years from 2017, just to give you one example, LEAP Community Engagement Activity had only actually reached 206 fathers. And so thinking about this and through deliberately developing partnerships with community organisations who specialise in dad's work and investing in those organisations and our work with them. And they have brought to us and um, helped us to engage with the community they've already built those trusted relationships with. And in the last 18 months alone, we have more than doubled our reach to fathers through that partnership working to 485. Another thing to think about is trust and the mutual value, which I've mentioned previously, and power balance. Building trust, as we all know, takes time and consistency and genuine effort. Attempting to rush this process can undermine the authenticity of the relationship. And trust is built in partnerships through shared experiences, open communication, and demonstrated reliability. It might be helpful to ask yourself, how are you intentionally building trust in your partnership? Are you putting in the necessary groundwork to foster a solid foundation that ensures that that partnership withstands challenges and stands resilient over time? One of the interesting things that's come up in discussion with partners about establishing trust is the impact of the imbalance of power in relationships. This has been particularly relevant when it comes to smaller VCS organisations who are in partnership with larger charities, commissioners or even funders. As you can see from the quote on the screen, one of the organisations felt that as they were from and worked tirelessly with a community that was seen as hard to reach, they felt that often partners wanted to work with them merely as a gateway to reach the community rather than really valuing and investing in the actual work that the organisation was doing with the families themselves. They felt that there was really an imbalance in power in those partnerships, as there was little mutual value or benefit, and it felt very one-sided. The King's Fund have actually done some really interesting work into this topic, and they've done it in their research on their Healthy Communities Together programme, and they recently, in November last year, published some findings in their report called Transforming Partner Power, Transforming Power Relationships in Partnership Working. You can have a look at it up. But they describe that it's actually helpful to recognise that, that power is a dynamic property in all human relationships. It's a balance of who needs what from whom that they say you should think about it as, rather than power being a tangible asset that can be divided up or passed from one person to another. This understanding of power about needs can often offer a different set of opportunities to identify how those imbalances might arise without intentionally meaning them to do so. Think about who needs what from whom in the partnership. Is this reasonable? Are all needs being met? And how might they be um, those imbalances being addressed? And so you might want to reflect on how power imbalances might be impacting some of the partnerships that you're part of and what, might you could, what you might do to address some of these. And as we consider all of this, it might also be worth thinking about what you could do to ensure that you're building equitable partnerships that are truly mutually beneficial. This leads really nicely onto my next point, which is making the journey in partnership from competition to collaboration. The nature of the voluntary community sector landscape is inherently competitive most evidently for funding opportunities, but less obviously there is competition for service users, use of space, tangible resources, and even staffing. Although the voluntary community sector often provides a refreshing approach and strives for a society-centered vision, we can't escape being influenced by the wider capitalist society that we function within. Therefore, to develop authentic, committed, collaborative partnerships within which each partner really champions the success of the other as much as their own organisation, even when push comes to shove, takes time and is definitely a journey rather than a task that can just be ticked off the to-do list. LEAP is supporting, as I mentioned earlier, First Five Lambeth to embark on the journey from competition to collaboration as a brand new consortium launched last year. And there's already been times within this partnership journey that not all members of the consortium have had the same benefits. And so they've had to have many discussions around this, 
re-emphasizing the varied benefits that their partnerships provide with a particular reminder that money is not the only benefit, which is something we all have to remind ourselves of now and again. One of the keys to success of surviving this journey is keeping an eye on the vision, but that this is also equally important even when there are two partners. The consortium members as partners frequently revisit their vision and thinking about what it means to each of their organizations. And it's crucial that the shared vision aligns with the individual vision as a reminder that all of the collaborative work is in fact serving the individual purposes too. This is a culture change, this journey. And this level of trust to allow truly collaborative partnership working takes time and a whole lot of patience. There's some questions on the screen that you've been looking at that might be interesting for you to reflect on. Where are you on this journey? How um, do the many benefits of collaboration drive your partnership? And have you discussed your shared vision, even if there's just two of you? And does it align well with each of your organization's vision? Lastly, as we are running out of time, it leads nicely into my final point, which is how do you find time when you're time poor? One of the words you'll have heard most from me here is that this, this work takes time and you'll have heard it all the way through the presentations that we've done. And that's the one thing we're all lacking. There are no easy fixes. And this is particularly a challenge when there are limited access to longer term funding. As many partnerships start around a piece of work and much of this is short term funded. I know that actually somebody mentioned it in the chat. And this often doesn't allow the time for partnerships to be meaningfully embedded. So I just wanted to share some practical, quick ideas about how to squeeze out every last drop of time when it comes to partnership working. Building on what's already there, think about um, where you could build on relationships that you already have, where that trust has been started. And that works really well from the co-create funding program leading into the first five Lambda consortium. So have a think about who are you already in relationship with in that way. Secondly, what opportunities could you take to deepen the personal relationships with the people that you're working with? We're all people, although we talk about and we work with those organisations, the real trust comes when there's personal connection between the people that are working for those organisations. So I would suggest a couple of things. Be real with each other and keep in touch, even if it's just a text or a WhatsApp or a one-line email sharing anything from when you've had a bad day to having a good session or you might have won some funding be real with each other keep that going and do it little and often it doesn't you don't have to have a long intense meeting you could just meet short times or have those little email interactions with each other and then factor your meetings in at other times and kill birds two birds with one stone food and drink we're all eating we're all having coffee or tea you might as well do it together building um, personal connections it's really um, a way of doing that is over coffee or lunch. And lastly, thinking about where could your partnership open up opportunities to that long term funding? All of this effort you're putting into building trust is investment into the potential for securing those larger funding pots, which can then further embed the partnerships that you're developing. Thanks so much for listening, and I hope that you found it helpful. I'm going to now hand back over to Tanya to wrap things up. Ooh. Thanks, Davina. Right, well, that brings us to the end of the webinar where we've explored our cross-cutting learning and insights in relation to reaching families with young children. I did say it's like an octopus. <laughs> we really hope you found today uh, useful and thought-provoking. I think we've only got one question that we need to, um, that we've received that we can answer. Uh, we've probably got a couple of minutes actually. Um, but before that happens, I'd just like to thank everybody, all the presenters and the team behind the scenes, uh, Yolanda Ferguson, who's done the tech today. And just a reminder that the following uh, the webinar will value your feedback on a sh short survey that will circulate. We'll send everybody the presentation um, and links to access our free full learning report online. Uh, please, please do get in touch if you want to discuss any aspect of this work, whether it's something you've heard today or something you look at uh, within the report. So we've got one quick, quick question from Susie Baker, who has asked, given that so much of this work hinges on personal relationships, how do you support staff and volunteer 
retention. So, I mean, I'll quickly just a few words on kind of staff retention. I think just general good management practice, good ones, regular catch ups. The team actually have a bi weekly meeting, which we use. Uh, to horizon scan so not just look at what we've achieved and what we need to be doing but actually what's coming up this works really well for us um, and as I said we don't you know not everything um, yields a success so we celebrate the successes and where possible we try to uh, take as much as we can in terms of learning from from what we've done and I think that really maintains a good sense of motivation um, I think in addition to that any kind of investment in staff training um, uh, and capacity and inviting your staff to share ideas um, and, and their skill set. Uh, Kim, do you want to add anything on the volunteer aspect? Uh, yeah, I think just, yeah, very quickly, I think in terms of the volunteer retention, um, the sort of individual, the time and the resources that we invest in providing individual one-to-one -one support. So we're able to work with volunteers individually to set and support them to achieve and then review goals. I think that's been really crucial in terms of retaining volunteers. Um, and then, uh, yeah, as I spoke about, sort of regular opportunities for volunteers to connect with each other. So we have monthly catch-ups, we have socials, you know, there's a WhatsApp group. Um, and then, as I spoke about, I think sort of keeping volunteers as central stakeholders in the work that we do gives volunteers um, the opportunity to shape the programme and, uh, yeah, be a key player in that as well. So I think these, yeah, they've all been um, ways in which we've been able to retain volunteers. Most volunteers, we ask to commit six months. Some of them have been with us for years. But we also see endings as really positive as well. We see it as a real success story when volunteers do move on um, to new opportunities. That's it. Thank you, everybody. Um, and have a great day. Bye.